Listening to the Exploded Show, JC King with you. Super excited. This is a guy who I, uh, I'm pretty sure if I think about it, I had scheduled the interview with him three or four times and rescheduled it and never really did it. But here he is, all the way from the hallowed halls of crack.com and the author of the great Abraham Lincoln pocket watch conspiracy. It is the one and only Jacopo de la Quercia. How do you do? Thank you very much for having me tonight. I wanted to give you the soccer style intro. That's my favorite style of intro. Mm, no, it's beautiful. I'm honored. Yeah, it's either for me, it's always soccer, UFC, or wrestling. Those are the best intros. Those are the top three. You do a lot of, uh, I'm sure, when you write for Crack, crack they do list. That is the top three types of intros soccer, <laughs> wrestling, and uh, whatever the hell the other one I said was. See how good I am at this? <laughs> uh, are, you, are you kidding? This is like worthy of ancient Rome. Like I'm totally honored. I actually think that crack should take a lesson. This is how all my articles should begin from now on with that intro. Yes. Yeah, soccer intro on all of them from now on. Now I will say it's very interesting that you hooked up with the cracked website because cracked had what I consider pretty rare in the world. Uh, they had kind of a second act because I know cracked from back in the day when they were shitty mad magazine. Do you remember these days? Oh, hell yeah. I remember, you know, going to the supermarket with my mom and there would be Mad Magazine and next to it would be Cracked. And uh, I think the the earliest memory I have of Cracked, I think, was when they did a parody of, uh, what was that movie, Speed? Back yes. in 1994. Yes. So, one, that's a sign of how old I am. And two, that's a sign of how old Cracked is. But uh, yeah, from what I heard in the uh, the mid aughts, Cracked started creating uh, its online website, which uh, Jack O'Brien uh, really launched and... Uh, Started started his website with just something like a few hundred views every week into what it is right now, and, and I joined. Yeah, I joined them in about 2009, I think it was. Yeah, uh, honestly, it truly started just as a learning experiment. I was getting subjects that I was covering in the classroom as a teacher, and I just wanted to see if the voice I used in the classroom could be successfully published in writing on Crack.com. Oh wow! And my writing, uh, yeah, that's what it how it began, and it worked pretty well. And since then, I've written in total over 150 articles and videos for them. Now, what's interesting about Cracked is the website has well overtaken now. I mean, Cracked.com is its own entity. And I guarantee you, if you were to stack up what Cracked is now compared to what Mad Magazine is now, I think Mad Magazine is like almost non-existent comparatively. Cracked is like where it's at now. Well, I mean, as with any publication or really any media that's been around for a long time, be it Mad Magazine, be it The Simpsons, be it Saturday Night Live, it really goes through waves in its evolution. Yeah. And in many cases, those waves are decided by a generation of writers that are with them for that one moment. I mean, uh, yeah, what is it? Mad Magazine has high days and low days and really high years and low years. And when it comes to Cracked, it just seems that Cracked, the magazine, always, always, always was the the bastard illegitimate son but it's kicking ass now. it's just kicking Mad ass magazine. Now. yeah oh yeah well i mean the truth is i mean it really comes down to the quality of the writers the imagination and in my opinion the big thing is the risk that the publishers are willing to take because i know plenty of people out there on the internet people who i you know chat with on twitter people i'm friends with they have wonderful ideas they're very talented and they just don't have the opportunities to be able to do what I did on Cracked. Yeah. So as long as there's people who are out there who are willing to, you know, be daring, who are willing to reinvent the wheel when it comes to internet comedy or scholarship, or in my case with Cracked, both, I mean, we just need those people out there. We need the funding, we need the opportunities, and we really need really just the trust. There Plenty were these little there windows. When you're talking about these windows of time, where there were certain things that owned that space. It was almost like in the late 70s, maybe mid-70s even, when there was a magazine called the National Lampoon that really <laughs> owned that space from a publishing standpoint and really changed a lot and probably paved the way for things in the future. But yet, short of that little space in the 70s, kind of went by the wayside. And that's kind of how I feel like for the 80s and 90s, I mean, I was raised on, on Mad Magazine, and I think for people now in this day and age... If you were what I was when I used to read Mad and Cracked, if you're 14, 15, kind of a coming of age, kind of the age I was when I started listening to Weird Al, um, I think Cracked.com would be the, the place to go for those people in this day and age. 
You know, mm. I think that's where they go and that's where they get stuff. And it's really interesting because unlike a lot of other things, you can learn a lot from Cracked as well. Like there's a lot of learning to be had there. Well, yeah, the truth is when it came to me with Cracked, as I said, it began as a learning experiment and a teaching experiment. I was writing my articles with the same attention to detail that I would do with a scholarly article. I've written about, I'd say I've written probably close to a dozen scholarly articles in my career. And I can tell you that I've written some articles for Princeton that were published in less time than it took for me to write Cracked articles. Oh, wow. I kid you not. Wow. Now, now here's an interesting question for you. Since you do sure. now, were you uh, a teacher? So you said originally you were a teacher. Are you still a teacher? And what was your uh, vo- What was your niche? Were you a history oh, teacher, sure. or what were you? Uh, yeah, the way that it started is I was teaching a class at a community college on Renaissance art and Renaissance history, and also the poet Dante, which is medieval slash Renaissance li- uh, literature. And the reason why I was doing that is because with my background, my education, and my interests. It was primarily, I had two main interests. One was politics, U.S. politics, yeah, and the other was the Renaissance. So a way that I linked the two of them together was by focusing my research on Niccolo Machiavelli. So oh, with yeah, Machiavelli, wow. yeah, he was like this little, if you can imagine it, he was like this ring that was linking these two different interests that I had together. I did and read I would The go, Prince, and that messed me up, dude, when I was in college. That messed hey, me up. It, Listen, it probably messed you up for the better. It's one of the most important books ever read. I mean, written. I love The Prince. And and it was really that marriage between history and politics that Machiavelli uh, wrote about and that he researched that I tried to duplicate in my own career. I went back and forth between teaching uh, classes at the college level or um, at the university level and going back and forth between that and politics. And as I was doing that by freak luck, I started writing for Cracked, as mentioned, just as, you know, like a a test. And I was featured in their book that became a New York Times bestseller. Now, one of the things that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going. I'm loving it. Keep going. Oh, well, basically, well, once that happened, I was in a bit of a pickle because I had just finished working on my second major political campaign. I worked for the Obama campaign in 2008 and then for a judicial campaign in 2009. And it now came to the point where. I was writing, I was putting my name on material and I needed to have, uh, I, I didn't know if I needed a pen name or not. So I contacted some people in Washington who were much, much wiser about this. And I said, do I need a pen name? They said, yes. So I chose a pen name that A, is basically identical to my real name. I tell people all the time, I hate to disappoint, my name is not Jacopo, it's Giacomo. It's <laughs> the same goddamn names. Just one is Latin, the other is Italian. Yeah. And, and another thing is, as someone who knows a lot about um, medieval literature, it was very common during the Middle Ages and also during the Renaissance for Italian writers to Latinize their name. For example, we all know about Christopher Columbus. We don't know about Cristoforo Colombo. The reason why is because Cristoforo Colombo Latinized his name as a formality when he was doing his writing. Oh, wow. So, so there's a little bit of history behind doing that. Look and furthermore, that. Jacopo, and furthermore, Jacopo de la Quercia is a nickname I've been called my entire adult life. My sister, she's an artist, and she used to call me Jacopo de la Quercia just because, as mentioned, it's Jacopo and Giacomo is the same name. And the last reason why I really enjoyed and why I still stick with this uh, pen name is because I believe it's very much what my writing is all about. Jacopo de la Quercia, if you Google him, is a CNE sculptor from the 15th century. I've probably done wonders for his Wikipedia page. I'm very proud of that. Yeah. That is what my writing is. It's a secret history lesson. So just as Mark Twain meant something very near and dear to Sam Clemens, Jacopo de la Quercia means something very dear to myself, which is history, specifically a surprise history lesson. So I'm really... As you got right now. Yeah. No, I love it. I love these little surprise history lessons. Actually, it's got me down a mental train here as you're talking, That and in, in, this is where the audience is going to kind of go 50-50 on me because I am a uh, fascinated, I'm a political guy. I'm kind of a news junkie myself, um, mm-hmm. but I'm also a philosophy uh, guy. I really love, like uh, recently I've gotten into kind of the idea of like meaninglessness and insignificance and uh, nihilism and stuff like that. And and one of the things that, that led me down that train is this idea that at some point I remember in my life, so you mentioned in 2008 in particular, you were um, signed up for the Obama campaign and going back to that time, 
I, I couldn't mm-hmm. have been more excited. It was probably the most excited I had ever been for a candidate. Um, mm-hmm. I was filled with all these ideas of hopes and dreams and, and you know things about that nature, and uh, and what could the potential of what could be, and then it kind of comes to a grinding halt when it meets reality, and mm-hmm. expectations uh, were set that were probably impossibly high to deliver upon. But that led me to this weird retreat from the idea of hope. Meaning like uh, Lewis Black, who's a great comedian, um, always talked about how, you know, hope is, 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 is for the young and it really is. You, the older you get, the more you realize it's bullshit. And so mm-hmm. I was like, oh, maybe that's true. Maybe there's truth to that. And so by the time we come back around to this day and age in, uh, in the United States where we kind of have the Trump thing now, which is the exact opposite of Obama, I wonder if some weird way it's some kind of like psychological response to the idea, oh, we tried hope. Now let's go the complete opposite, whatever the hell hope is. Let's just go destruction and nihilism and let's go blow the whole goddamn thing up. So I'm very mm-hmm. interested in like, where do you think, how does this fit into a philosophical context? How does this fit into a historical context? Is hope worth having? All these things. Jacopo, I know it's deeper than a lot of stuff, but I, I, I don't want to take us down this road, but I got to because you, you, my mind is spinning now listening to you, and I feel like you have answers. So help me out here. Hey, listen, I'm telling you right now, if people asked me to write cracked articles about this, I would, gladly, when it comes to uh, you know, hope versus gloom and doom, when it comes to humanity. Yeah. I mean, I personally think, in my personal opinion, I believe that if we lived without hope, I think the human race would have gone extinct by now. The so you reason think we why, need it? Yeah, it, well, exactly. I mean, you could view, like, what is hope? I mean, you know, it's sort of like, what is love? It, it is possible that at the end of the day, what we call love is nothing more than a evolutionary programming that's embedded in us for the purpose of reproduction. Now, at the same time, when it comes to hope, what is hope? Well, it's possible that hope is something that is also part of our blueprint. Hope might be something that made Homo sapien the dominant species of this planet. It might be hope that made us explore. Hell, it might even make, it might even be hope that made you know um, essentially a fish grow limbs and walk on land for the first time. (laughs) So, but I mean, in a more specific sense, I mean, I really mean this. It is impossible. I mean, it is almost impossible for us to imagine what humanity has survived. We survived the bubonic plague. We survived, what was this? uh, Something called the Clovis event where, uh, what was it? An asteroid crashed into earth and the entire human population dwindled down to 15,000 people. Really? I've never heard of this. This seems like a thing I should have heard about. Yeah. It's known as the, it's known as the bottleneck of the human genome. And uh, yeah, they said at the end of the day, it is speculated. It's not a hundred percent. Actually, you know, I'm not too sure right now if it's uh, absolutely confirmed, but from what I've read about it, it is most likely that at some point, I think 15,000 years ago, that the entire human population was down to just several thousand people. Wow. And it was during that time that uh, the woolly mammoth went extinct, that um, the Neanderthal either went extinct or completely uh, intermingled with Homo sapien until they no longer existed. Yeah. Yeah. But one way or another, I mean, when you look at it with my own experience, when it comes to the Obama campaign, I mean, when it comes to hope, I mean, hope is something that is just not going to go away because it survived so much. Yeah. I mean, hope survived the Holocaust. Hope survived Hiroshima. So the argument is, your argument would be functionally, as a species, we need it to continue to put one foot in front of the other. Well, for me, I wouldn't even say it's so much as we need it as the fact that it still exists. What we can prove is that hope for whatever reason, continues to bob to the surface, even when it looks like it's completely drowned out of existence. We know this because it continuously happens, which raises the possibility, is hope something greater than Homo sapien? If every single human being is dead, does hope still exist somewhere in the universe for another life form? And something like that. That's a very intense thought. That's a great thought. Boy, that is well, something I mean, to dwell on. Yeah. But when, well, exactly. And that's when you sort of zoom out of the camera a little bit, and it's like the end of Men in Black, and you start to realize how very small humanity is when it comes to the larger idea of hope. Okay, let's just take a pause so, for a second and say not many people can thread that needle. That was a hell of a needle you just threaded. A Men in Black analogy, 
all the way back to the existence of hope as some eternal being. So this is very well done on threading that needle, but continue. By, by m- no means am I loving every minute of what you're saying right now. Uh, I, I hope everyone's admiring my needlework. I never mm. considered myself a tailor. <laughs> so uh, couldn't it be argued then that hope in, is, is kind of intertwined with the ideas of like, because I recently one of the things I've become uh, enamored with or infatuated with or whatever you want to call it, sometimes I dip in and out of religions the way some people try on shoes. And uh, right now I've, I've been uh, reading about Catholicism, going to uh, Mass a lot. And one of the things they always talk about is the great, the three things that sustain humanity, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Obviously everybody's kind of heard that saying before. And I always thought of those things as kind of, um, things that we have to have in order to make the, the world make sense simply because I think there could be a counter argument to be made that we are essentially, like you said, how resilient we are, kind of a virus, meaning wherever mm. humanity goes, we tend to be a bit of a toxic species. We pollute the environment. We kill whatever we're, you know, we kill a lot. We've destroyed things. Um, so I think there could be a slightly more, if you're looking at it almost like the, a negative version of it, I think there's or a pessimistic viewpoint. Um, there could be a counter argument to be made that we can be a virus. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, when one person like Donald Trump has the ability to destroy the entire world, you know, just because he needs a distraction from a Russian investigation, then that is dangerous. It's a sign of flaws in our constitution, flaws in our government, possibly even flaws in ourselves as a species. Well, it's a great argument that we let the uh, executive branch have way too much power, right? I mean, the fact that he can just do all these things is crazy, right? Well, well, this is the interesting thing when it comes to executive power. The truth is throughout American history, there's many instances where great things have been done because of a single individual seizing and possibly abusing executive power (laughs) beyond the Constitution. No, I'm serious. No, it's great. I love it. I I have taught classes on the Emancipation Proclamation and Abraham Lincoln. And we read the document. We hear President Lincoln's order. And there was one time I had a class of about uh, a dozen or two dozen students of all different ages, all different backgrounds, all different careers. And after presenting everything, I said, how many of you believe, after what we discussed today, that Abraham Lincoln had it within his authority as president of the United States to issue the Emancipation Proclamation? Not a single hand went up. So it was definitely an abuse of power, but it was a great abuse of power. Well, I mean, well, this is the thing. When it comes to an abuse of power, is it possible that he was abusing a government that throughout its entire administration was a corrupt government or yeah. an immoral government or a government that had tied itself to slavery yeah. and thus had lost its moral mandate to abide by its own rules? So, I mean, when you look at it that way, we've seen abuses of power that have done great things. Yeah. And we've seen abuses of power that have done terrible things. So I really think just going back to what you were talking about when it comes to President Obama and just, you know, how quickly so much of the hope went away and also how it just seemed unrealistic, almost impossible for him to aspire to them. Yeah. What I would comment on that, what I would sort of tack on to it, in my opinion, is the fact that the potential was there. But I really think that what failed him was the government that he was working with, because FDR did not have the Republican Congress that Obama did during his first or second or third or fourth term. Well, I think what's insane is the Republican Congress, apparently it doesn't matter who the hell is president, can't do anything. They're like just amazingly inept is what I found. It's like, doesn't matter, because I thought like, oh my gosh, now it's Republican Congress and a Republican president and a Republican everything. Look at all these things they're going to pass. And yet they've proven that they're really not very good at they're good at obstructing, but they're not very good at like uh, doing things. I've found. Well, I mean, you know, how, you know, how we were talking before about magazines, websites, television shows that go through different waves of talent yeah. and of uh, production. Basically, in my opinion, the Republican Party since, uh, in my opinion, the failure of the George W. Bush administration and also as a result of the disastrous ethnocentrism of Karl Rove's strategy of pitting Americans against Americans in the wake of the terrorist attack of 9-11, when we could have been together and stronger than ever, I really believe that the one-two punch of those two disastrous policies have just made this current crop of Republican administrators in the United States so inept and so morally bankrupt that, in my opinion, 
the two party system is completely non functional because no, the two party system that. it's a joke. Yeah, the two party system requires I don't like the two party system. I don't like it. But it's like a bike with two wheels. The bike needs two working wheels in order to function. I mean, if you don't have one wheel that works, then either you can be an incredibly talented president and just ride the bike on one wheel or you're going to be like anybody else and the bike's going to fall apart because you need two wheels. And the Republicans, they're not a flat tire. They're basically a dead weight. They're like an anvil on a wheel. You simply <laughs> cannot ride a bike if one of your if one of your wheels is a goddamn anvil from, you know, from Warner Brothers. You simply cannot do it. It's very interesting because like what I when I hear you, what I think is all the time. Oh. I tend to be, uh, well, I consider myself an independent. I'm a swing voter. I can go a lot of different ways, and I voted for every every party under the sun. But if I had to nail myself to uh, some sort of party, I, I definitely would identify more strongly with libertarians because mm-hmm. I like the idea of uh, kind of socially liberal, fiscally conservative, or even if you really, if you had to say something, that's a way to say it. But I like the idea of like to each their own. As long as you're not infringing on somebody else's rights, you should be able to do whatever you want. And uh, I'm really open to those things. Now, I'm not well, fully thing. crazy. Like, it's... I still like the FDA. No, I, that's where I lose libertarian sometimes. Because I go, <laughs> I, I do appreciate having my medicine regulated. But Well, that's the thing. I mean, when it comes yeah. down to the idea, of course, you know, there's lots of good ideas out there. Like Christianity, you know, love your neighbor, provide for the sick. You know, you know, what is it? Uh, what was the other thing? Uh, don't use what like, you know, no war, no weapons. He who lives yeah, with the sword dies yeah. by the sword. Yeah. Those are all great ideas. Those are fantastic <laughs> ideas. But when you have a man like a, when you have a maniac like we did just in the last two weeks, murdering women and children and grandmothers mm. in a church. Yeah. And then people like Paul Ryan are saying that people who are saying that we should be talking about gun control just do not understand what faith is. Well, I'm going to say people who are making that argument don't understand what Christianity is. So in my opinion, when it comes to that, there's plenty of good ideas around there. But uh, to borrow a little bit from what Jesus said, and I believe it was a gospel according to Mark, I think it was, a religion that does not show for its works is basically a fraud. Yeah. And as long as we have the political parties, be it insurance companies, be it someone who lends you money. It doesn't matter. If you have someone who promises many works, but they don't even attempt to deliver to them, then they are, very simply put, a fraud. That deal uh, that happened was insane because um, it's so, like, the fact that it was, uh, the guy got a gun legally and it passed a background check, even though he shouldn't have, what a failure of the system to protect like that like that was the most horrifying and that the military was the ones that dropped the ball through a paperwork or clerical error i mean boy do they i i couldn't i'm still speechless you could tell speechless from this whole deal cuz i went this is why we've got to do something cuz i i'm i've got mental health stuff as much as the next guy i got to take a a pill to get through the day man uh, now, I mean, but this I is take the kind it. of thing. Now, this is the kind of thing where it's almost like floodgates. You have to look at every single seatbelt that failed yeah. and say that seatbelt is broken. We need a new one. I don't care how long the paper trail goes. I don't care how many Democratic presidents were affected by this or could have made a difference. They have to look at every single barrier that we had in our country that should have protected the people from this lunatic. Yeah. And for every single one of them that failed, we have to completely discard it and start from scratch. Because when it comes to the point that you can no longer pray safely in a church for the many people that are killed by gun violence, yeah. then we have to stop pretending that we are a nation of law and order. Because then we're just a nation of luck and chance. So just like, you, gonna, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, yeah. Well, you could you could have gone on for ten minutes. I felt it. You were ready. You're getting the blood yeah, pressure. I appreciate that. No, no, no. It saved us some time. Thank uh, you. <laughs> uh, no, what I was gonna say is though. So I think you'll say you brought up slavery before, which is like I wonder if that original sin is something so great uh, of a sin or a mistake that sometimes I think it's almost karmically going to haunt the country forever because of what we did. Sam, similarly, I wonder in some ways if this Second Amendment wasn't just a horrible mistake. Like, it's kind of a crazy... The people that think, like, well, the purpose of the Second Amendment is to have... So the citizens can take up arms against the government if it's ever too oppressive. And I go, are you aware that they have drones 
and nukes because it's not like your 22 semi-automatic rifle is going to square up against a nuclear weapon if the government chooses to use it against you. So I kind of yeah. think the Second Amendment seems, to me, just to me, dumb. That's what I think. Yeah, well, let me explain. First of all, the Second <laughs> Amendment. If you read the Second Amendment with a very basic understanding of the English language, you, if you read it plain spokenly, it means that the government has the right to have a well-regulated militia and for that militia to bear arms. Now, for the first 150 years of American history, that is the only thing that the Second Amendment meant. If you look at Supreme Court cases in the early 20th century, when it came to the whole issue of does the Second Amendment guarantee a universal right to bear arms, that argument did not exist because there was absolutely no legal precedent for it in any of our courts. It was never backed up. It was never supported until the mid 20th century. And the problem is we tend to think that history begins and ends with what we're able to see. We think that, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance always said under God, "Uh uh-uh, that was added in the 1950s. We tend to think that, you know, the American salute was always, you know, raising your head to your brow, completely overlooking that in the 1930s, you had people raising their hands and saluting in a way identical to the Nazi salute. Oh, wow. They had to revise. That's why they revised it. They're like, oh, no, we can't do that anymore. That looks that doesn't look good, guys. Do it differently. Well, no, no, it, was, it was a little bit differently. It all goes back to, I mean, the Nazi salute, which it was really the fascists in Italy that were, co- they were copying the Romans. The, like the, Basically, the Nazi salute was a very cool salute going back to ancient Rome, and it was ruined by the Third Reich. They forever. ruined a so, lot of things. They ruined that. Yeah. They ruined the damn mustache. Yeah, I they ruined, they ruined the toothbrush. Yeah, they ruined the, what is it, the toothbrush, uh, the toothbrush <laughs> mustache? Yes. I mean, look, Charlie Chaplin, <laughs> Oliver Hardy. So many great comedians had to abandon that. It was heartbreaking. Most recently, the only guy ballsy enough to pull it off, Michael Jordan in the Haynes commercial in the mid-2000s. He went I remember brush. that. They, everyone watching that commercial thought the same thing. They didn't think about Haynes. They thought, did, did Michael Jordan just have a Hitler stash? That's what they thought when they saw that. I mean, out of all the people <laughs> in the country, I mean, the last person I would have expected. He pulled but, it uh, off. No. <laughs> yeah, but but anyway, but what I am what I am getting at is yeah. we, we have we cannot be short sighted when it comes to history or when it comes to the meaning of our laws, because when we do that, we sort of forget what exactly our country is all about. Somebody pointed we, that out to me with the monuments thing, man. They pointed out that really those monuments weren't put up like right after the Civil War. They were put up like during some time of like uh, when they started like desegregating schools or whatever. So it was almost yeah, like a you, middle finger to the African-American population because originally that argument made sense to me, meaning like these are historical monuments. Let's not take them down and whitewash history. That made sense to me as a broad argument. And then when it was pointed out to me, oh, no, you need to know those things went up not like 1865. They went up like 1962. And I was like, oh, no shit. And I was like, oh, that's crazy. That yeah, I mean, not only that, if you look at the you, if you look at how much the statues even cost, how they're built, a whole bunch of them are cookie cutter molds. You can yeah. put it. You can build a Confederate monument in your town with a six thousand dollar donation donation from, you know, some like sons of the Confederate memory, whatever lost cause or <laughs> foundation. They're everywhere. And it is disgraceful. They lost the freaking war. They made war with the United States, which was an industrial powerhouse they lost that war morally they lost that war militarily and it is absolutely disgraceful that anyone should even want to preserve the memory or the image or the visage of a government that was so stupid that they tried to make war (laughs) with the united states to preserve the worst form of slavery in the history of humanity there's no like, pride to be taken in the Confederacy. I feel like Jacopo, you you got a, a podcast in the future on your own. Oh. Jacopo for a half hour just going, just on his. I I don't even think you need guests. You just can. Here's the subject. Boom. Uh, all right, let's do this. I want to do a serious question and a light question to kind of bring ourselves to a, a, a close here. But we'll start seriously for a second because you are a historical okay. guy. Um, and I kind of want to frame it in the terms of history where we're at now. And the difficulty is without comparing it, cause this is where everybody wants to go without comparing it to Hitler, which I think is a, is a, is, is a bit extreme or at least a violation of Godwin's law to bare minimum. So without comparing it to Hitler frame the current, where we're at right now in American history with, with Trump and with the kind of divisive nature of the country, historically, 
make us all more comfortable, make us know this has happened before, and this is how it shook out. Like, like frame that for me if you can in some historical context. What are we going right, well, through right now? All right, well, one, uh, I would say that a lot of people do compare Donald Trump to Andrew Jackson. One, Donald Trump is not like Andrew Jackson. The reason why is because Andrew Jackson actually served in the military. Andrew Jackson was actually a POW. And Andrew Jackson actually knew that if you're a POW, in many, in many cases, you are not only a hero, you're a hero whose stories should be commemorated in American history for all time. Andrew Jackson was a POW when he was a kid in the Continental Army. Yeah. So basically, I disagree with the argument that Trump and Andrew Jackson are a lot in common. They do have similarities, and it is a handy t uh, teaching tool. But the differences just show how much less of a man Donald Trump is than Andrew Jackson. Yeah. Uh, historically, just trying to look back, I mean, there's a whole lot of parallels between Trump and Nixon in terms of just the inability for them to contain a scandal. But, I mean, if you compare Nixon to Trump, I mean, Jesus Christ. I mean, Nixon was evil, but he was at least an evil genius. Well, the, I mean, the, you know, the, the thing States he did with still... normalizing relations with China, I mean, he did some good stuff, too, at the end of the day. Yeah. He started the EPA, a lot of stuff. Well, not only that. I mean, when, when Richard Nixon was president, I mean, it didn't mean that it was the end of the union or anything like that. I mean, with, when it comes to Donald Trump, the guy's just systematically dismantling the entire federal government from the inside. And I mean, I will say this. I would say the closest we come to the danger that we could potentially be in with Trump, because I mean, there's the whole issue of how intimately was the campaign in cahoots with Putin and uh, the Russian Federation. If this truly was an instance where we had the Trump campaign working with a foreign power in order to come essentially into a position of power. If he was the Manchurian candidate, yeah. Yeah, if he's a Manchurian candidate, there's only two examples that I could think of that come close to that. One is the 1968 election, which we now know officially, without a doubt, was an act of treason on the Nixon campaign's part. For decades, there was speculation that the Richard Nixon campaign reached out to a woman named uh, Chunnelt, who was the wife of the ambassador to uh, South Vietnam. So during the Vietnam War, when tens of thousands of American boys were overseas and were getting killed and wounded for the rest of their lives, the Nixon administration worked behind the scenes of the U.S. government and the State Department to sabotage the Paris peace talks in order to um, embarrass the Lyndon Johnson administration and so Nixon could become president. For decades, that was theory until this year. This year, I believe it was the New York Times, they published Nixon's aide Haldeman's notes, which proved that it did happen. Did wow. a person illegally lie and deceive and ultimately commit treason to come into the White House before? Yes, that did happen wow. in 1968. Now, with that said, have we, have, have we also had someone who is incredibly high in power who is actually using their position to actively conspire to destroy the United States? That did happen as well. That was Aaron Burr when he was vice president. I mean, I can't believe the guy. I, like Aaron Burr, he was sort of like the Lex Luthor of American history. <laughs> like, he, was a, he, no, he, was a, he was a super villain, tall, bald. And he was, you know, this guy who was in a position where when he was vice president, he kills Alexander Hamilton and he was conspiring with, I believe it was the Spanish at the time, uh, to basically have the United States like be on the victim, of, what was it, be on the receiving end of an invasion that would completely destroy the country and it wow. was going to make him king of a country west of the Mississippi. It was the Aaron Burr conspiracy. Look it up. Go to Wikipedia for I it. I will be Googling this later because unfortunately, yeah. the way I was raised, the only thing I think about when I hear Aaron Burr is uh, a mouthful milk. of peanut butter going, Alan Burr! I know, you Alan said Got Milk. Burr. You know, many people don't know it. That was actually the original <laughs> Got Milk commercial. That was the one that launched them all. Oh, really? Look at you. Yeah, I, you even have history about the thing that I don't know history for. Look at you. Jeez, Louise. <laughs> Damn straight. Now, I, it's something that I found, you know, while, while doing a cracked article, I was researching it. It looks like that started off I think it was a Super Bowl commercial in the 1990s. It was originally a full minute long. And if you go on YouTube, you can see the original. Uh, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong on it, uh, when it comes to that. When it comes to Aaron Burr, every time I hear Aaron Burr, even in Alexander Hamilton, I always think, Aaron Burr. Yeah. It's just a part of my mind, like yours.
Uh, was uh, James Buchanan, this is completely unrelated, and I'll get to the fun question to end it with, was James Buchanan the first gay president? Because I read some stuff that makes me think we've already had a gay president, clearly, and that was James Buchanan. Well, I mean, I look at it this way. is He, he might be the first gay president we know about. There might have been some other presidents who might have privately been homosexual or possibly even bisexual. Fair point. But it, so when it comes to, yeah, so when it comes to James Buchanan, we have very, very good reason to believe that he was homosexual. I mean, the guy was a bachelor his entire life. He was very close friends with like a group of dandies, as they called themselves, in uh, Washington at the time. And, Didn't you know, he live I, with a dude and write love letters to a dude? Like in his like later years, post-presidency? I'll just say there's a lot of interesting writing in yeah. favor of the argument that he was our first gay president. But honestly, I don't like calling him our first gay president. Because he was someone who did not use his position in any way to make the United States safer or more friendly or more tolerant oh, to homosexuality. And at the same time, I don't want to say he was the first gay president because we're probably going to be having men and women in our lifetime who were gay or lesbian or who were bisexual. And they deserve the title more than James Buchanan because James Buchanan was an awful, awful president. It's not. I get what he, you're saying. Historically, though. We can't completely take it away from him. Completely. Well, but look, this is this is how I look at it. We'll be able, like, we can say that from what we know, he was our first gay president. But we shouldn't be erecting monuments and statues about it because we're just one love letter away from finding out that George Washington was our first gay president. True. Or that Thomas Jefferson was our first gay president. I mean, true stranger that. things have happened in history. That's true. This, the history is a strange, a strange beast. Last question. Important question for me. I'm a big yeah. believer in it. I love, and it's in your book, The Great Abraham Lincoln Pocket Watch Conspiracy, which I'm going to give oh, yeah. a full plug to. It's a historical fiction novel. Here's the plot for you. President William Howard Taft, scientist and son of a former president, Robert Todd Lincoln, Secret Service Chief John Wilkie, and Captain Archibald Butt and others slowly unravel a worldwide conspiracy over a decade in the making. It's a great book. You should definitely get it. The Great Abraham Lincoln Pocket Watch Conspiracy. Since William Howard Taft is in the book, and since William Howard Taft is my favorite president, because, uh, <laughs> and this is going to sound... Um, Politically insensitive, but he was a giant fat man. I want to know, <laughs> will we ever have a giant fat man be president again? Because I'd like that to be the case. Well, I am sorry to say we might already have one because I saw somewhere on <laughs> one of the... I saw somewhere on one of those rogue, uh, one of those rogue White House uh, Twitter accounts that they said, uh, according to his most recent physical, Donald Trump is 349 pounds. That is one pound away from William Howard Taft at his fattest. Whoa, look at this. Look at this. See, this is where this is. You know how to put a pin on things. Oh, yeah, my well, God. Well, let me put it this way. If you compare <laughs> the two of them to each other, without a doubt, pound for pound, William Howard Taft is the best fat president we've ever had. There we go. There we go. Look at this. Jacopo de la Quercia. He writes for Cracked. You can read his articles on Cracked.com. He wrote the book, The Great Abraham Lincoln Pocket Watch Conspiracy. Where can people find out more about you, my friend? Uh, just follow me on Twitter. Go to my website, uh, jacopodelacuercia.com. Check out my books on Amazon. Share them with your friends. Read them. Review them. I hope to write many more of them. Thank you all for your readership. There you go. Check him out. And with that, man, I really appreciate it. What a great conversation. It was fun, man. Oh, wonderful. Thanks so much. All right. We'll be back after a quick break. It's the Exploded Show. <laughs> 